we're going to take a look at the early 20th century in two really important places across the globe. Uh, today, we're going to look at India, or excuse me, China, and then we'll examine India in the subsequent day here, uh, here in the interwar period. Um, and why we want to be able to do so is because of uh, the importance of both China and India uh, today. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at um, the present and also some of the past here, and you're going to need to use some of this material uh, for the questions that you're going to answer later on here. But again, the importance for today is the following. The first of which is that China today is one of the most key, um, important economies in the globe. And if we use a measure called price purchasing parity, uh, which is kind of like GDP, um, we're going to find that the European and United States have two of the biggest economies in the world. But subsequently following uh, those two are China, uh, Japan, and India, and all of which are growing at a rapid pace. Not only that, but we have immensely large populations in both states. China is up to about 1.4 billion, uh, and by 2050, we estimate almost 1.5 billion Chinese in China. And in India, uh, 1.23 billion today, and it will exceed China uh, by 2050. At least that's what the projections lay out. But neither are these countries a just simply... Um, uh, weak states that are developing sort of the uh, little things of the world here. And in fact, both states are creating uh, and have a large number of science and technology graduates, they, uh, and they're graduating um, a lot of engineers per day. Whereas if we're looking at the United States, we're looking at about 70,000 engineers that we graduate each year. In India, we're looking at 350,000. In China, about 600,000 engineers. Okay. Um, and so they are really your competitors in the new global market. And it's important to look at these growing powers in the 21st century and how they are affected. Okay. We also want to look at and examine the uh, historical background for each of these states as well. Okay. And part of the uh, East, uh, at least from the perspective of Western Europe, is that uh, this is the place where uh, you went to seek goods and to obtain um, the most uh, priceless items across the globe, whether it's Chinese silks, Indian cloth, and so forth. Okay? But from there, there are some big differences between the two states. Okay? India is a region of immense diversity, okay? the homeland uh, and the birthplace of some of the major religions across the globe, okay? including uh, Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, and Sikhism, and uh, a large number of uh, Muslim adherents as well, but immense diversity in terms of religion, uh, class, uh, and ethnic identity as well. Historically, however, it's been one of the more decentralized, meaning there are very few times in Indian history where uh, they were united by a single empire. In opposite of this is Imperial China, where they have created for themselves one of the longest lasting unified groups of uh, people in human history. So, uh, so much so that this entire region it has been seen as Chinese for the longest time, rather than if we look at Europe, where there are dozens of different national and ethnic identities in China, you could have the same amount. Okay? But okay, the notion of being Chinese, and particularly Han Chinese, okay, is uh, uh, the identity that we associate most with in China. And not only that, but it has a long-standing government system, whereby they are, for the last uh, 2,000 plus years, okay, China, throughout most of its, its history, has been ruled by a powerful emperor and one of the most organized bureaucracies. In other words, they are one of the first uh, societies that chose the most talented individuals to become government officials. And you would actually have to even take a test uh, and uh, obtain a high score in order to uh, get these particular positions. Okay? And so two of the wealthiest, most powerful regions in the world okay, by the 19th century okay, has reached a point whereby okay, they both of them have weakened. Okay? And much of this has to do with okay, uh, what using Western power for the first time to obtain okay, the desired goods uh, from the East. Things like Chinese silks, okay? um, Chinese silks, we have uh, uh, what we call uh, vases and other porcelain goods. Um, for us, now just simply known as, um, as uh, fine china. And not only that, okay, particular goods, and for the British, what they're looking for are things like tea, for instance. 
Okay, and so the tea trade and really the, eventually the tea obsession is going to lead Britain to enhance or to try to grow their trade in China. But it would not be that easy because there's nothing necessarily that the West is producing that the Chinese actually wanted. And so as a result of this, okay, the British particularly needed to find something else for themselves to be able to trade to China. And as it turns out, that trade happens to be illicit and illegal drugs. This drug called opium, okay, which is a hallucinogen, which means that okay, in China, in, uh, when you, if this is consumed, it's grown from poppies, by the way, okay, it's something that it's been, that it's usually consumed through smoking, but it's something that just knocks you out. Okay, and you're imagining all this crazy stuff. But what it does if you're a working individual, okay, it keeps you from working. Okay. And uh, as the addiction will grow in in China, as the British will end up smuggling these drugs into China, uh, receive silver um, as a result, and using that silver to purchase tea and other material, okay, southern China is going to struggle uh, immensely. Okay. And so as a result of this, a uh, China figured that it had had enough, and so it ended up declaring war on end up declaring war on Great Britain and uh, leading to what is known as the Opium Wars. Okay? However, uh, this is a war that China could not win because of the new industrial power that Great Britain was. Okay? And so as a result of this, what was passed were a number and a series of what we call unequal treaties, okay? whereby China was forced to um, succumb to a number of issues, the first of which would be uh, the opening of further ports, whereas there was only a single port where British traders could come in. Now, all of a sudden, there were so many more. Okay? Um, not only that, but there were missionaries that came into uh, China. Um, and as a result of missionary work, uh, there was some miscommunication, and it actually ended up leading to an enormous rebellion um, in, southern, in southern China that lasted over a decade. And because China was losing all of these wars, it tried to industrialize as quickly as it possibly could. And in, sort of, in the late 19th century, uh, they started what is called a self-strengthening movement to try to bring in Western industries, uh, weaponry, uh, and so forth. But the problem was, uh, and especially when it was put to the test, when the new Chinese military was put to the test in a war against Japan over the region of Korea, the Chinese end up losing. And there was a counter revolution to this, what is known as the Boxer Uprising of the, uh, right at the turn of the century, whereby there was a, a small group of individuals that would attack Westerners. And this became an anti Western, anti industrial, um, uh, event, uh, whereby really gangs of people started to come out and to find any Westerners they possibly could. And because it was a Europeans and Americans uh, that were being attacked, a joint army was sent into China, both the Americans, Germans, British, French, and even Japanese, that were sent into China to stop this particular rebellion. Okay. But by the 20th century, the most powerful state in the world throughout human history was weakened to the point of civil war and leading to uh, the 1911 revolution that finally overthrew this 2000 year imperial system. Okay? Um, and they're gonna try as best they can to create a new modern China in the Western sense. Okay? And so under the guidance of a Western educated doctor by the name of Sun Yat-sen, Okay. And also by the pressures made by uh, students in what is known as the May 4th movement. Now, now this movement is associated with um, the end of the First World War. Uh, China had actually joined the side of the Allies and hoping that they would actually gain something from the war. Okay, they didn't. Okay. In fact, they ended up losing some territories to Japan. And so as a result of this, the student movement was hoping to try to create and establish a new modern Chinese society in the likeness of Western society. In other words, democracy and capitalism over traditions like Confucianism uh, and others. Okay? A political party was created by Dr. Sun Yat-sen and other students and other uh, Western-oriented leaders. They created this political party called the Nationalists. 
Okay? And throughout the 1910s and 1920s, okay, they sought to end the civil war in China where you had all these competing ideologies and competing warlords okay, who are fighting over who would lead China. Now, Sun Yat-sen will pass away in the early 1920s, but his key disciple, a man by the name of Jiang Jiexi, uh, will become the leader of the nationalists. Right? And he will start to reunify China together right, into a single entity. However, there is a particular wing of his political party right, known as the communists, who would actually help them to unify China. But seeing that this particular group would become a major challenge, uh, particularly a challenge to the nationalists, he turns against them. Right? And so Jiang in 1927 ends up attacking every single communist that he could find, forcing the communists, who is a really a, an urban working class group, to flee into the countryside. And at, at this point, uh, the, one of the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party, a, a man by the name of Mao Zedong, uh, is going to find himself in the countryside and will find himself with new allies. And so we're gonna take a look at this particular document uh, today called the Peasants of Hunan. And in this, Mao is gonna find a new and a different vision of communism, one that is different than the one that's being established in the Soviet Union. So you're gonna go ahead and take a look at this document, okay? And you're gonna answer the uh, discussion questions uh, that are uh, laid out for you in that Google Doc. Okay? And so there are six questions for you to answer. Um, and some of what we've just gone through in the lab can help you to answer question one there. Okay. So as a new vision of China is being established, okay, they are still being pursued uh, by the uh, Jiang Jiexi and the nationalists. And so many of these communists are going to find themselves fleeing for their lives. And they end up on this thousand plus mile journey uh, running away from the nationalists and their army and going across China and meeting groups of peasants all across China. And as it turns out, this potential disaster is going to be quite beneficial for the growth of the Communist Party uh, in China as well. And if I can provide it for you, there's also an optional video that you can go and take a look at called the Incredible March, okay? um, or what is known as eventually in history as the Long March in uh, 1936, uh, 1934 to 1935 and 1936. All right, guys, uh, go ahead and take a look at the document. Thanks for your attention.